good afternoon and the uh, information uh, policy census and national archives subcommittee on oversight will come to order uh, without a uh, Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. A welcome to today's oversight hearing on National Archives, advisory committees, and their effectiveness. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the National Archives' uh, use of federal advisory committees. We will consider several important topics, including the statutory requirements of federal advisory committees, the impact of the advisory committees on NARA decision-making, relevant developments in presidential libraries, and compare NARA's use of two very different committees. The National Archives' stated mission is to serve American democracy by safeguarding and preserving the records of our government. As we will hear from our witnesses today in order to help them fulfill their mission successfully, NARA employs advisory committees uh, made up of outside experts and subject to the uh, Federal Advisory Committee Act. We will examine two of those committees this afternoon, one for the Electronic Records Archives and one on Presidential Libraries. Before we go to our witnesses, I would like to address the role of advisory committees under FACA at the National Archive. Presidents and executive agencies have utilized outside expertise uh, since George Washington's presidency and Congress has exerted legislative control over advisory bodies since 1842. Responding to increasing concerns that federal advisory committees were inefficient, inaccessible, and imbalanced, in 1972, Congress enacted uh, FACA, re and which requires that committee membership must be fairly balanced in terms of the points of view represented and the functions to be performed, and the committee should not be inappropriately influenced by the appointing authority or by any special interest. Additionally, FACA requires nearly all committee meetings to be open to the public. This subcommittee is concerned about NARA's advisory committee on presidential libraries, both as regards its effectiveness at this critical time for presidential records and libraries and in terms of NARA's compliance with FACA. As we will hear from our witnesses, the Committee on Presidential Libraries is very different in important ways from most federal advisory committees, including another important NARA committee on electronic records archives. NARA claims that the membership of the advisory committee on presidential libraries must be limited to representatives of the private foundation that build and support the libraries because they have been deeply involved in the development of the various libraries and can speak with authority on issues that arise in connection with establishing new libraries or administering existing ones. Obviously, the expertise of the foundation is quite valuable, given the rare world that they live, live and work in. After all, there are currently only 12 open presidential libraries in the federal system and understanding how to prepare for a bill, maintain and support one requires a very specific set of skills and experience. However, that the membership is so narrowly limited concerns this subcommittee. In light of FACA's clear requirement that committees be fairly balanced in terms of the points of view represented, the advisory committee does not include any other relevant stakeholders, historians, archivists, preservationists, curators, and other museum professionals, educators, researchers, whose experience, perspectives, and skills could greatly assist NARA. Also troubling is the fact that the committee appears no longer to meet. There are many serious issues surrounding the presidential libraries not the least of which are the current plans for the next library for former President George W. Bush, and yet the Advisory Committee on Presidential Libraries last met in January 2006. 
almost four years ago. As far as this subcommittee knows, there are no plans for the committee to meet again, even though NARA continues to reauthorize the committee and appoint or reappoint members from the private foundations. The challenges faced by new and existing presidential libraries are not limited to fundraising and construction. There are serious questions of prompt and proper access to presidential records, the records management <laughs> policies and practices of presidential administration and executive agencies, the care, preservation, and ex exhibition of priceless artifacts and other national treasures, the security of presidential collections at the libraries and at other NARA facilities, the role of the libraries in the education of our young people, the historical balance or often lack of balance within permanent and temporary museum exhibits, just to name a few. It is this subcommittee's hope that through our hearing today, we will gain a better understanding of NARA's reasons for treating this advisory committee so differently and will provide the National Archives with some valuable information they can use in order to make their advisory committees more efficient and effective. Now, on today's topic, I will, uh, I will now yield to the distinguished ranking minority member, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina. And uh, uh, Mr. McHenry, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I know it's not easy to make the trek up to the hill, but we certainly appreciate your time and your testimony, um, as well as the written testimony you've already submitted uh, for the record. Um, and we'll also be exploring pretty uh, important uh, subject matter today uh, and that goes often unnoticed, uh, and that's fed federal advisory committees. As we'll hear testimony today, in 2008, 49 executive departments and agencies utilized advisory committees consisting of over 63,000 committee members serving on more than 900 committees and providing advice to government officials and employees. These government advisory committees are governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, as uh, uh, the chairman mentioned, which was passed in 1972 as part of a good government initiative. Uh, as the chairman says, advisory committees go uh, significantly further back, obviously, than 1972, and Congress's role in, uh, in oversight of those advisory committees is certainly important. FACA requires that committee members be fairly balanced in terms of, uh, well, quote, fairly balanced in terms of the point of view represented and the functions to be performed, end quote, and the committee, quote, not be inappropriately influenced by the appointing authority or by any special interest, end quote. FACA is designed to ensure both the even-handedness and transparency of federal advisory committees. Moreover, FACA provides for multiple tiers of oversight by the President, Congress, and the GSA, which we'll certainly hear from today, and the agencies themselves, which uh, additionally we'll hear from today. It is in this oversight vein that we are here today to explore the operations and uh, efficiencies and the eff efficacy, uh, furthermore, of the advisory committees, uh, giving advice to the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA. Uh, to that end, we will be hearing from NARA officials responsible for the agency's committees, the General Services Administration, and the committees themselves. It is up to us as members of Congress to ensure that NARA's advisory committees, which are often made up of members outside of government, are living up to the good government standards set uh, fourth under FACA. Uh, the National Archives, much like advisory committees in general, is an agency that conducts in invaluable work. That's uh, certainly true. Uh, but not always with the highest level of public scrutiny, as often important agencies are lost to public scrutiny. Uh, perhaps because of this lack of transparency and sunlight, the agency has suffered multiple egregious security lapses as of late. Mr. Chairman, while I believe that the recent National Archives security breaches represent a much more urgent call for appropriate oversight hearings uh, by this committee, as we've previously had, and I appreciate your leadership on that, uh, I look forward to uh, today's testimony so that we can ensure advisory committees are acting in a balanced and transparent manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, I thank, the, uh, uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. McHenry, for your participation in this hearing and in, in previous hearing uh, and your cooperation on these issues. Was one thing that they can never say about this subcommittee is that 
uh, we do work together and that we do understand the importance of these issues. So thank you for your service. I, I would now like to introduce our panel. Our first witness will be Sharon K. Fawcett. Ms. Fawcett is the assistant archivist uh, for presidential libraries. In that position, she provides policy, direction, and oversight of the 13 presidential libraries administered by the National Archives and Records Administration. Uh, Ms. Fawcett began working at the National Archives in 1969 and as an archivist in this, on, this, on the staff of the Lyndon B. Johnson Library. Ms. Fawcett is the committee decision maker under FACA for the advisory committee on presidential libraries and welcome uh, today here at this hearing, Ms. Fawcett. Our next witness is Martha Murphy. Uh, Ms. Murphy is currently the Chief Information Officer of NARA. She is responsible for all NARA information technology projects, including the acquisition of NARA's ERA system, a system that preserves and provides long-term access to uniquely valuable electronic records of the U.S. government and transitions government-wide management of the life cycle of all records into the realm of e-government. Uh, Ms. Murphy is the committee decision maker under FACA for the Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archive. After Ms. Murphy, we will hear from Dr. Christopher Greer. Uh, Dr. Greer is currently the Assistant uh, Director for Information Technology Research and Development at the White House Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy and was previously Program Director for the Office of Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Fund Foundation. Dr. Greer is a member of the Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archives. Our final witness will be Robert Flake, uh, who uh, Mr. Flake is currently the director of the committee management secretary, an organization that monitors and reports executive branch compliance with the Federal Advisory Committees Act and is also deputy executive director of the Office of Policy Initiatives at the General Services Administration. He previously served as the deputy executive director of the Office of Administrative Policy and uh, Office of Government-Wide Policy of the General Services Administration and as the head of the committee operations staff and later uh, deputy director of the Science Advisory Committee at the EPA. I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to your testimonies. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it, it is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Would you all please stand and raise your right hand? Do you, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And thank you. You may be seated. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, and I ask that each witness now give a brief summary of their testimony. Please limit your summary to five minutes. Your complete written to statement uh, will be included in the hearing record. And I have just been informed that Ms. Fawcett and Ms. Murphy have been replaced as committee decision makers of their respective committees as of yesterday morning. And we will let the record reflect that. Uh, Ms. Fawcett, you may begin, please. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, I want to uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today on NAR's use of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The Advisory Committee on Presidential Libraries was established by the former Arch Archivist of the United States, Don Wilson, in 1988. The committee last met on January 26, 2006. Former archivist Don Wilson tasked the committee to provide advice to the archivists on matters relating to the archival museum and public programs of the presidential libraries. The original membership was composed of representatives of each of the foundations or families that had developed an existing presidential library. It was intended that the membership expand when new presidential libraries were created, and so it did. The meetings served as a forum for the discussion of issues relevant to NARA and the presidential foundations. 
Over the 21-year history of the committee, it provided the archivist advice and recommendation in a number of areas, including the need for additional government resources to support core programs, comments on a 1995 report on the relationship between the presidential libraries and their support foundations, the responsibility for funding renovations, exhibits, and programs in presidential libraries, ideas on marketing strategies for presidential libraries, whether the National Archives Trust Fund Board should re-examine its trust fund investment strategy in order to increase returns on investments, and whether NARA should consider the possibility of allowing dual compensation for library directors who also served as executive directors of library foundations. After the 2006 meeting, Archivist Alan Weinstein did not convene subsequent committee meetings. Representatives of the foundations, not the advisory committee, have chosen recently to meet among themselves to discuss issues of common interest and concern. Foundation and or family representatives convened together at a Washington, D.C. hotel in April 2008. Archivist Alan Weinstein and I were invited to provide an update on NARA and library activities following an evening reception, and we did so. We did not attend any of the discussions the next day, though it is my understanding that these discussions focused on budgetary issues, including funding for core archival processes, digitization, and information technology. I was asked to address whether NARA has received all the information from this advisory committee needed to properly evaluate the proposal for the planned George Bush Presidential Library. Neither Archivist Carlin nor Archivist Weinstein used the committee to evaluate new library proposals. NARA developed architectural and design standards in 1999 which governed the design, building, and acceptance of a presidential archival depository. The archivists invited representatives from the George W. Bush Library Committee to meet with the advisory committee in January 2006. At an informal lunch following the meeting, the library directors and members of the committee provided suggestions on best practices and mistakes to avoid. My office compiled a summary of the advice for the Bush Library Committee, which I have provided to you. The archivists encouraged the Bush Committee to visit some of the presidential libraries and meet with library and foundation staff, which I believe they did. As NARA laid out in our report, Alternative Models for Presidential Libraries, our relationship with library foundations is complex. The government's role is to run the library, which involves preserving the collections, processing the records for public access, and working to ensure that the historical content of exhibits and education programs reflects an objective perspective of the presidency. Even as the private foundations have carried the major financial responsibility for funding our exhibits and programs. Exhibits today, which incorporate cutting edge technology and dramatic design elements, are costly, as much as $10 million to design and install a new permanent exhibit. Five library foundations have recently funded or are currently raising money for new permanent exhibits. While there are many positive benefits to the unique relationship NARA has with the foundations, the foundations and NARA's view of our stewardship responsibilities are not always aligned. Presidential libraries serve a broad constituency of users who hold divergent views on the priorities and mission of presidential libraries. I have long thought that the advisory committee representing these multiple stakeholder groups could provide the archivist with advice on a broader range of issues. However, it is also important for the archivist to have a forum in which to discuss important issues of concern to the National Archives with the foundations who provide substantial support to the libraries. In late 2004, I discussed the issue of membership with archivist John Carlin. Archivist Weinstein held two meetings of the committee. He and I discussed whether to make changes to the membership of the committee. In December 2008, the archivist resigned before making any decision about the future of the committee. Earlier this year, acting archivist Adrian Thomas considered not redoing the charter. However, as Carlin did previously, she decided to leave the decision to the next archivist in the United States and therefore elected to renew its charter for another two years. Family members, former associates of the presidents, and foundation members from the committees where we have libraries have served on the committee. It is my understanding that FACA does not bar an agency from establishing a limited purpose advisory committee with a more focused membership such as this one. The library foundations are an important partner and the archivist needs to be able to meet with them individually and as a group. The FACA established committee provides an open and transparent way in which to conduct these meetings. The next archivist will need to consider the important question of whether to keep this advisory committee as it is currently constituted and or establish a new committee with a broader membership to provide more divergent feedback and advice to NARA on its presidential libraries. 
Thank you. This concludes my oral statement. I will be pleased to answer any of your questions about the advisory committee. Thank you, Ms. Fawcett, for your statement. Ms. Murphy, you are recognized. Be sure the microphone is on. <laughs> Chairman Clay, a ranking member. Pull it member. closer to you. There you go. Chairman Clay, ranking member McHenry. Um, I am here as the designated federal official for the Archivist Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archives. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on the National Archives and Records Administration use of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and specifically the Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archives called ACERA. ACERA was established by then Archivist of the United States, Alan Weinstein, in 2005. This committee meets twice a year in April and November, and information about the meeting and the meeting minutes are available at the National Archives website. The last meeting was held on April 29th and 30th of 2009. The costs for that meeting were approximately $9,300, which included travel per diem and supplies. Since its creation, this committee has scheduled nine meetings and met eight times. The ninth meeting will be held on November 4th and 5th of this year. Archivist Weinstein established the committee to serve as a deliberative body to advise the Archivist of the United States on technical, mission, and service issues related to the Electronic Records Archives, known as ERA. This includes, but is not limited to, advising and making, making recommendations to the Archivist on issues related to the development, implementation, and use of the ERA system. ERA is an information technology system being built to support the preservation of and access to electronic records that are complex in nature, diverse in format, and exponentially increasing in volume. The challenge that NARA faces in the area of electronic records is one that is shared throughout the government and the private sector. The original ACERA membership consisted of 18 members considered to have particular expertise, knowledge, and interest in electronic records. Today's membership consists of 17 recognized experts and leaders with active interests in records management, electronic records, information technology, and research in federal and state governments, academia, and the public and private sectors. The meetings serve as a forum for the discussion of issues relevant to NARA and the Electronic Records Archives and are therefore not strictly structured to only provide formal recommendations or findings. The meetings are also an opportunity for NARA to communicate to and to seek feedback from the, com the committees on, excuse me, to seek feedback from the committee on NARA's strategic plans, the state of the Electronic Records Archives, the newest releases and developments of the ERA system, and any electronic records challenges encountered since the previous meeting. Committee, committee members often add value to the meetings by discussing their own projects and activities that are relevant to electronic records and information technology. Over the four-year history of the committee, it provided informal recommendations and advice on the architecture and design of the ERA system, an approach to processing Freedom of Information Act requests for the presidential electronic records, a review of the Hitachi Content Archive platform to be used for processing records, a review of the Global Digital Format Registry Initiative, discussions of the pros and cons of a federated electronic management model, and a review of the requirements for public access um, within the ERA system. The November 2000 and, 2009 meeting agenda includes an overview of NARA's Center for Advanced Systems and Technology, a presentation on the use of ERA in presidential libraries, strategies for communicating ERA progress, and a discussion of NARA's conceptual framework for digital preservation. In my letter of invitation to this hearing, you also asked for my views on this advisory committee and if there is anything that should be done to improve its service to NARA. It is my opinion that this advisory committee is useful and necessary to the Archivist of the United States at a time when preserving and providing access to the growing volume of government electronic records is made even more challenging by the rapid changes in technologies that create those records. Government does not have all the answers to these challenges, but thankfully, with ASARA, we have a, di a diverse group of experts who are willing to give their time to help us stay focused on feasible, cost-effective, and most importantly, 
far-sighted solutions. I am personally thankful we have SARA, and I do not see any need for changes to its charter. It is my hope that the new archivist will find this a useful forum as well. Thank you. This concludes my statement, and I'll be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Ms. Murphy, for your statement. Uh, Dr. Greer, you are next up, five minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Greer, and I'm a member of the National Archives uh, and Record Administration's Advisory Committee for the Electronic Records uh, Archive, and I thank the chairman and the ranking member for the opportunity to meet with you uh, today. I I'm here today representing myself as an individual member of the ACERA. I've been an advisory committee member since 2007. I'm a scientist by training and uh, was a faculty member at the University of California, Irvine for more than 18 years before joining the federal government. I've been an employee of the National Science Foundation since 2003, where I recently served as senior advisor for digital data in the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. I'm currently on assignment from NSF to the Office of Science and Technology Policy, where I serve as Assistant Director for Information Technology, Research and Development. And I also co-chair the Interagency Working Group on Digital Data of the National Science and Technology Council's Committee on Science. Uh, your committee has asked witnesses to describe their advisory group's purposes, uses, and uh, effectiveness, so let me describe each of these in turn. First purposes, the ACERA was, is charged with serving as a deliberative body to provide advice to the archivist on technical, mission, and service issues relevant to the development, implementation, and use of the electronic records archive. The operative word in this charge is deliberative. Uh, the committee's central function is to analyze ERA issues, weigh options, and evaluate solutions. The committee's deliberations are typically intense and engaging. Uh, next, uh, uses. The committee is used to air ideas and opinions on strategic, technical, and implementation issues. My experience is that NARA uses the committee to probe the full spectrum of ERA uh, issues. Recent topics have ranged from design concepts for the reference architecture through standards adoption and supported formats to details of the project timeline and work status. The committee typically uses an action items me uh, mechanism rather than formal recommendations reflecting a spirit of uh, partnership and an emphasis on real progress. Each meeting generates five to ten action items and the re resolution of these items is tracked in the minutes. Finally, uh, effectiveness. In my opinion, five factors have allowed uh, ACERA to be effective. First, NARA places a high priority on the uh, committee. The archivist or acting ar archivist and ERA project leadership attend nearly the entire two-day meeting and actively participate in debate and discussion. Second, the committee is consulted at each major project phase. The committee meets twice each year, a frequency is about right for this multi-year uh, project. Third, uh, ACERA is given the opportunity for full uh, deliberation. Each meeting is conducted over two days, providing the time needed to tackle complex issues in a thoughtful manner. Fourth, the uh, committee is given the information it needs to provide informed advice. Briefing materials are complete and candid, and we get an honest look uh, at all sides. Fifth, uh, ACERA is used to address questions of substance. Briefings focus on challenges, options, and implications rather than on defending a preferred choice. NARA leadership and staffers alike engage in honest debate and demonstrate a willingness to change course in response to a compelling case. Because of these factors, I've found ACERA membership to be valuable uh, and rewarding. I hope these comments are helpful and I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. And now we will hear from Mr. Flake. Mr. Flake, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Chairman Clay, uh, Mr. Ranking Member McHenry. Um, my name is Robert Flack. I, I'm directing, I direct the Committee Management Secretary at GSA. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the important role played by federal advisory committees in the work and missions assigned to the executive branch, and in particular for NARA's advisory committees and the two in particular that have been mentioned already. During previous testimony before the subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, I've had the opportunity and occasion to discuss how GSA and executive branch uh, agencies and departments manage their responsibilities under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. I've also included that uh, material in my prepared testimony, which I've submitted to you. So therefore, I'm not going to repeat those in my, my oral statements, but I'm going to cover the the questions that you had asked me in your, your letter. 
At NARA, just as any other executive department and agency, the agency committee management officer has responsibility for the implementation of FACA on behalf of the agency's head. Within NARA, individual designated federal officers work with the CMO to implement the Act's requirements at the committee level, and together the two of them are responsible for ensuring that NARA's compliance with FACA, GSA's regulations and guidelines, NARA's internal operating procedures, and any other applicable statutes and regulations are, are adhered to. Um, as both you and, and the ranking uh, member both mentioned, FACA is quite detailed in specific procedures, and it does mention the uh, requirement for balance in advisory committees, and you both quoted uh, Section 5 of FACA in that membership of advisory committees is to be fairly balanced in the points of view represented and the functions to be performed by committees. Now, FACA doesn't say much more about it than that. That's, that's about as much as the statement exists. Uh, we have incorporated additional language in our regulations in 41 CFR 102-3 on balance, and we specifically state that in the selection of members for the advisory committee, the agency will consider a cross-section of those directly affected, interested, and qualified as appropriate to the nature and functions of the committee. We also apply additional guidance in our regulatory uh, package that, that lets agencies uh, evaluate other ways of selecting and balancing their committees. Mr. Chairman, in your letter to me, you asked specifically about these two narrow advisory committees, the Advisory Committee on Electronic Record Archives and the one on Presidential Libraries. Both of these were established as agency authority committees, and as such, they are discretionary and they report to NARA. The Advisory Committee on Electronic Record Archives was established in 2005. Its most recent charter was renewed in August of this year, in 2009. It has 16 members, all of whom are special government employees. According to data submitted by NARA in our shared management system, which is our online FACA database, from fiscal years 2006 through 2009, the committee met twice each year and expended an average of about $38,000 each year. Cost figures for 2009 are still tentative, pending reconciliation of that data through our annual comprehensive review. According to its charter, uh, the committee serves as a deliberative body on technical mission and service issues related to electronic record archives, as Dr. Greer mentioned. I might point out that as a deliberative body, I've noticed this committee does not typically use a formal recommendations mechanism. That is to say, we don't see formal recommendations listed in our database. Uh, we do see, though, in the minutes that are online for this committee, a number of action items that are identified in the minutes, as Dr. Greer mentioned. The Advisory Committee on Presidential Libraries was established by NARA in 1988. Its uh, most recent charter was renewed in July of 2008 with 12 members who are representative members. That charter is still active. It's a two-year charter. It will expire next summer. According to data submitted to us by NARA, this, the committee has not met during FY07, 08, or 09. And as mentioned earlier, it did meet in 2006. NARA does report one recommendation issued by the committee during its lifetime in our system. And again, that's the information that has been received by my office. According to its charter, the committee is to advise the Archivist of the United States on matters relating to the archival, museum, and public programs of the presidential libraries operated by the NARA, and advises the Archivist on policies, procedures, programs, objectives, and other matters relating to the effectiveness of the public presidential library system. Mr. Chairman, you'd also asked me to address the degree to which NARA's advisory committee's process gives NARA relevant information that it needs to conduct its business. And I have to say that's a little difficult for us to determine at our distance. Uh, you did hear some of that from Ms. Fawcett earlier uh, regarding her committee. Uh, GSA does rely on executive departments and agencies like NARA to provide real-time data throughout the year and to wrap it up at the end of the year and verify it on their committees uh, so we can verify that information by the close of the fiscal year. And looking at advisory committees, though, uh, from our perspective, uh, we can estimate a committee's value to an agency in a couple of ways. One, if the committee is meeting frequently, uh, does the committee, is the committee used a lot by the agency? Does it get a lot of opportunities to participate with the agency and the public? The number of recommendations issued by the committee and whether or not, most importantly, the, uh, those recommendations are adopted by the federal agency. And finally, uh, if we get feedback from the agency through our desk officer program in my office. And lastly, since these committees in both cases have been uh, renewed on a regular basis, from our perspective, it would appear that NARA finds them both to be benef beneficial and can, will continue to renew these. Uh, I'm not sure whether the Presidential Library Committee will change as a result of a, ch a change in the archivist. Uh, that's a matter up to the agency to, to decide, and I defer certainly to NARA on that. 
Mr. Chairman, that, that, term, that ends my uh, oral statements. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Flack. I appreciate your, your insight and testimony. And le let me start with Ms. Fawcett. Uh, in light of the board and serious challenges facing presidential library and the fact that they aim to serve uh, many different kinds of groups and individuals, can you continue uh, to justify limiting the membership of the committee solely to representatives of the private foundations? Well, I don't think in the end it's my decision. It'll be the decision of the next archivist. As I said in my testimony, we, we are interested in what other stakeholder groups have, and NARA reaches out on a consistent basis to talk with those divergent stakeholders. We held meetings of public interest groups uh, uh, with regard to the uh, alternative models report and our thoughts and recommendations on changes we might propose to the Presidential Records Act. As a result of that meeting, we chose not to propose certain changes to the act. We meet regularly with educators, uh, and, not, uh, and we meet with um, historians and other special interest groups. Um, each of the individual libraries reaches out to many of the groups in their communities. Um, they, they work with uh, local school boards and local school districts in developing curriculum packages to, for visits by school children to the, uh, to the various libraries. So there is much that's done by NARA to continue to reach out to all of these groups. Uh, on the other hand, you know, um, having a way and a forum in which to meet with the foundations is, um, is a strength and provides um, a useful forum for the archivist when he chooses to do that. Archivist Carlin, for example, um, used the meetings that occurred during his tenure to focus on the issue of funding programs in presidential libraries and to get the, um, the foundations to understand the necessity of their stepping up to the plate to provide for the exhibits and education programs and public programs that make a library a viable and vibrant entity. Uh, and I think that, that very use was very helpful. On the other hand, the foundations gave feedback to the archivists, and I, I think members of the committee might be surprised to know how interested the, foundation wa the foundations are in ensuring that NARA has the resources for core processes, processing declassification was a very important issue to these foundations. They wanted to see the presidential records open. They wanted to see records declassified. And I think as a result of their urging, the urging of many other stakeholder groups who talked to NARA, Congress did see fit to provide us with additional resources for processing presidential records. We added 15 new archivists in the Presidential Record Act libraries, and we have the largest staff of archivists ever at the George W. Bush Library. So, so, so I found the so committee has been think, useful. You do think we need to have historians, archivists, preservationists, researchers, curators, educators, and others? I think it's very important to hear from all of those groups, and NARA reaches out to them. I think. Do you think they should be on the boards? I think it's fair. I, I think it's per, a perfectly reasonable thought okay. to have them on board in this committee, and that is okay. why. Archivist Weinstein and Archivist Carlin and I both discussed the membership, but for various reasons, it didn't occur. Carlin was leaving. I became acting archivist for presidential libraries just before John Carlin left okay. the agency and just before Weinstein was sworn in. Archivist Weinstein um, held two, member, two meetings of the committee, but I think that his particular style, he preferred... Um, a more individual, one-on-one -on -one relationship with the foundations. And so he sought to interact with the foundations more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And um, I think that may have been one do of the you, reasons why he had so few meetings of the committee. Okay, do you think they should meet regularly? I think it's useful for them to meet regularly, yes. Okay, when you, uh, when you uh, reach out to other stakeholders, as you mentioned, uh, are the contacts subject to uh, FACA? Well, uh, it depends on, it, we, you can have a single purpose uh, meeting with other stakeholders mm -hmm. and not 
be in violation of the FACA. We work very closely with our general counsel's office when we set up any of these kind of meetings to ensure that we are in compliance with the FACA. Well, you take recommendations from them from the different stakeholders, right? Uh, yeah, we listen, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that all comes into the decision-making process under FACA. It, be it becomes part of our decision-making process as we listen to people one-on-one uh, -on -one or in small groups. We're, we're not meeting with them on Ms. a regular basis yeah. on any one subject. Ms. Fawcett, has any of the following uh, items occurred since the last meeting of the advisory committee. And I've got a list here, so I want to ask you to re to okay. to respond to. Has NARA accepted any presidential libraries into the system since you last met? When was Clinton? Would it be the... Clinton what? Clinton was already in the system since we last met. No. We, oh, yes, we have the Nixon. Nixon. The Nixon Presidential okay. Library was okay, accepted so into the system in July of 2007. Excuse okay. my memory okay. blank here. So that's, that's pretty major. <laughs> that's pretty major, correct, to get a new library into the system. Yes, it is. Okay. Has, has any presidential library undergone or, or announced plans for major renovations to their physical plants, such as expansions or other kind of capital improvement projects? Yes, we're working on capital improvement projects in several presidential libraries. Currently, uh, Roosevelt and Kennedy on mm -hmm. Dock are uh, Johnson. Um, and that's so, pretty significant, too. I mean, to go through a major renovation is pretty significant. Yes, but we don't depend on the advisory committee for advice on those renovations. Uh, NARA has architectural and design standards that govern mm -hmm. the, um, the renovations of these buildings. Uh, we, we work closely with our preservation staff, our facility staff, with the library where the renovations are being considered. Okay. All right. Let me ask you Let me go to Dr. Greer. Uh, or or Mr. Flack. Uh, there seems to be many areas where NARA's reporting is either incomplete or incorrect in the FACA database. Uh, is the agency responsible for providing accurate, up to date information for the public? Yes, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. The agency enters the data into the system, which is a public-facing system. The data is entered in in different ways by different agencies. Some agencies, the DFOs, the designated federal officers for the individual committees enter the data. In other cases, the committee management officer themselves reserves that right to themselves. In any event, the agencies do it they verify the data toward the end of the year during our annual comprehensive review process, which is ongoing uh, right, right now uh, through the end of next month. And then we work with them to verify that data at the end of, the, uh, end of that process. Um, why should we be concerned about compliance with information reporting requirements of FACA? Pardon me, Mr. Chairman? Why should we be concerned about compliance with the information reporting requirements of FACA in this instance? If the agency is, in, is reporting incorrect information, then either the Congress, ourselves, or other interested parties don't have an accurate understanding of what that committee might be doing, how much money they're spending, or how they're operating their committees. For the current fiscal year that just ended, 09, the data is still, I would call it in raw form because it doesn't get verified till the end of the year. But if you look at previous years, 08 and prior, that information has been verified by the agency as in, and is complete, and therefore should be accurate. Okay, thank you for that response. And talking about accuracy, I received a uh, response from archives yesterday uh, pointing out um, six discrepancies in um, information that they supplied to this committee. Uh, one of them was on uh, how to classify uh, members of the advisory com committee as special government employees or, uh, or as representatives. 
Uh, and then they say we've changed the designation for these members in our 08 report. And now they are all current, correctly listed as representatives instead of special government employees. Um, they talk about appointment type. Have you seen this letter? I saw it this morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it's, it's six different areas uh, that they had to correct. What, what do you think of this? This is pretty, this is going by the seat of their pants pretty quickly here, aren't they? Well, it's, uh, it's always good to get the data correct, but uh, it's nice to have it right in the first place. Uh, eventually, you get it correct. We'd like to think so. But there's a lot of agencies and a lot of advisory committees out there, and in checking each of these over individually takes time. Thank you. That's, I might uh, point out, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the representative issue that you mentioned a moment ago. Yes. The, um, back in, in, in uh, 2004, the General Accounting Office, government, now the Government Accountability Office, did a review of, uh, of the membership balance issues. I believe you're aware of that and uh, directed that both GSA and the Office of Government Ethics uh, step up their process on ensuring that members were correctly designated on federal advisory committees, mm -hmm. whether they be representative members or special government employees. Uh, we have worked on that process with agencies back uh, from about that time in the mid-2004-2005 uh, timeframe. Uh, for this committee on presidential libraries, it, it would appear to be appropriate that the members be representative members. Uh, why they characterized them originally as special government employees, I don't know. But the change as it took place over the last couple of years was correct, and it was the correct direction for it to go. Thank you for your response. Um, Ms. Murphy, how, how important is the Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archives to you, uh, to the ERA, and to NARA? Um, as I stated in my testimony, very important. Um, whenever you're doing a large information technology project, you're very, very focused on doing that project and trying to meet deadlines. And it's always good to have an external opinion to make sure that our focus continues to be correct. And uh, Sarah certainly has provided um, great guidance to us. And um, some, based on the action items that we've received, we have um, made some changes in terms of the direction that we've gone with the system. Do, do you meet so often and for so long because of the complexity of the issues or because of the diversity of the membership views or both? Um, I think first the complexity of the issue, um, actually both. The membership, because they're, they're from both the private, the public sector, um, from universities, people who have an interest in, in electronic records as well as information technology, when you have um, people with those skills all in a room together, um, the discussion really, really does get to a level uh, to, to really help us uh, make determinations on the direction the system should, should go. Can you uh, give me a, a specific example or two of how the committee's advice or assistance has improved the Electronic Records Act archive? Um, I, I think from my own experience, um, in the area of public access, uh, this is a, this is an area that I'm um, that I'm very interested in. Um, at our last meeting in April, we provided um, a, a a presentation on the direction that we were going um, f towards public access, something that we're building right now, and um, and the advisory committee offered several suggestions that we accepted and, and that have been added to our requirements. Uh, and also offered um, some possibilities in how we might, we might share the development of a, the prototype with them um, as we go forward. Thank you for that. Do you think uh, the committee could have provided NARA with such uh, assistance if it were comprised only of individuals directly involved with NARA and only representing one general area of the ERA? Uh, no, not at all. Having the, having the blend of people who have different experiences and come from, come, come from different organizations has really, and, and some of the things that they have experienced um, in terms of doing projects uh, just, just as have enhanced our ability to build ERA. 
very good to know. Thank you for that. Uh, and, Mr. and Dr. Greer, in your experience as a member of the Advisory Committee on Electronic Records Archives, does the committee as a whole or individual members of the committee provide assistance, guidance, or advice in any other for forum or by any other means than the committee's meetings? So, Mr. Chairman, the question is, are there other mechanisms that are used to provide advice to, to Yeah, I guess it ERA? would be email communications, um, letters. We, uh, there are, of course, materials that go out in advance of each meeting to uh, provide background for the uh, members uh, in scheduling uh, issues, things like that. Otherwise, there, there is not a lot of formal uh, back and forth. Now, we are all uh, of us involved in areas of digital preservation and access, and so we certainly run across one another individually and talk about general uh, technology issues in the course of, of events. Do you, and, and here's the point, do you think the committee could be effective without meeting as a group or if it did not meet for several years at a time? In the case of the, the Electronic Records Archive, which is a very uh, broad scope uh, project, uh, which is moving forward in a landscape of changing technologies, I think the only way to keep up in this particular instance is through regular uh, meetings where uh, people get together uh, and have an active uh, debate over things that don't have a single solution. Okay. You, uh, you said in your statement that the committee membership is diverse, providing a breadth of perspectives. However, uh, one could argue that because the committee's work covers a very specific era, er, area, not NARA's Electronic Records Archive, that the membership should be limited only to those with direct experience in such a unique field and only from the experience with the National Archive. Do you think the committee could be, be as effective if its members were limited in this way? The Electronic Records Archive, again, is a complex project that has uh, the issues of ingest from the various federal agencies, uh, permanent uh, preservation and access in its archives function, and access to, the, to a wide variety of communities in order to make that, that information have value to the public. And for, because of that breadth of issues, I don't think any one person uh, or one group, uh, interest group, uh, could cover all of that. So I think in the case of, of ERA, which is quite a unique project in NARA's history, the breadth of the project uh, demands a group that has considerable breadth. Thank you for that testimony. Uh, Ms. Ms. Fawcett, the membership of the Advisory Committee on Presidential Libraries consists solely of individuals who represent the private foundations that build and support the libraries. Is that correct? Private foundations or family members. Or family members, okay. Are these foundations completely separate from the, from the presidential libraries and the National Archives. They're completely independent institutions, 501c3s. Okay, for instance, do any foundations receive anything of value from any presidential library and or NARA? Do we fund so them? Do we give them any sources? Um, prior to the passage of the um, amendments of the Presidential Libraries Act and the 1988, um, when foundations provided um, a library to the government, the government then in return allowed them to use some space within the library. So a very few of our libraries actually house foundations within their space. After the amendments to the Presidential Libraries Act, that space is separate and apart from the National Archives. So yes, there are uh, that would be, I suppose, a benefit to, uh, to the foundations. So NARA covers the, um, the space, the utilities, computer equipment, government, Not the computer lines. equipment, not the staff. They cover the space and the utilities, but not, uh, uh, not the computer equipment um, or the staff. 
Okay, whose telephones foundation. are they? Are they um, government? It, var it varies. I think um, in most cases it's their own system, but in some cases they do use our telephones. How about furniture? They gave the furniture in the first place, so they get to use it. <laughs> how about, uh, how about uh, office supplies? They buy their own office supplies. Okay, okay. government email addresses? No. Uh, a couple... There are a couple that use the NARANET system, which is our internal system. Most have left NARANET because they don't like the security requirements, so they have their own systems. But I do think um, at, um, I think the Ford Library Foundation uses a NARA mail account. Does uh, NARA have a memorandums uh, or a memorandum? of understanding with these foundations for the goods and services the government provides. We have, um, we have joint operating agreements with the foundations. When they um, turn over to the government of library, we have a joint operating agreement that outlines um, the tenets of our relationship. And then does NARA calculate the uh, the value of these goods and services and, and is NARA compensated in all cases? Well, NARA is compensated through the funding of programs, et cetera. For example, the Johnson Library Foundation occupies um, a couple of offices and a little reception space in the library, but that foundation provides over one and a half million dollars a year in support for um, processing staff, uh, exhibits, public programs, etc. So, yes, NARA does receive something in return for the foundations being able to use that space. They uh, raise money on behalf of the library. Okay, other than vendors who are paid for their products and services. I, I'm sorry, other than who? Than vendors. Vendors. Vendors who are paid for their products and services in groups that rent the facilities for a fee, are there any other organizations that receive anything of value from any presidential library and or NARA? Any other groups that receive anything of value that, don't, that they well, don't we, pay for? Well, for example, we, um, we put on education programs for uh, classrooms around the country, and so classes of students come to the library experience our, our theater of decision making and there's, you know, there's no charge for that uh, service, so that, that I, I don't know what, what you're I was looking for, but, okay, I mean, look, that's an educational uh, uh, I can't think of any I group that's receiving free services from NARA. I don't know how you put value on that. Okay, the private library foundations are the only ones who receive anything of value from the National Archives then. And only a very limited number of them have, um, have offices in our space. Okay. All right. Mr. Flack, uh, these private foundations have financial relationships with the National Archives. Does the fact that the leadership or other representatives of these foundations serve on the advisory committee present any conflict or the possibility of a conflict of interest? Mr. Chairman, I can't speak to the relationship between the foundations and NARA, but with regard to the membership on the advisory committees, whoever that representative is from each foundation to the committee, uh, under the guidelines put out by the Office of Government Ethics, uh, representative members are not subject to conflict of interest rules. So while there may be an appearance issue here, uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, Office of Government Ethics would not uh, apply conflict of interest rules to those individuals. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And, and uh, Ms. Fawcett, has any representative uh, from the George W. Bush Library Foundation uh, been invited to join the committee, formally or informally? And if so, who are they and when did they join the committee? Uh, we haven't. We, ha we invited um, the Library Committee to attend the 2006 meeting, but because we haven't had a meeting since then, no formal invitation has been extended to the George W. Bush Library Foundation to have a, um, a member 
of the committee. So the answer is no, we have not. So you're waiting on the new archivist to invite them? Well, or? at such time as on the new archivist or at such time as we would have a meeting, then we would um, look to have a representative name from that uh, foundation. Okay, do you know who that person would be, who the contact person would be with the Bush Library? I know who I would contact at the Bush Library Foundation to make a suggestion whether that person would be the member or not, I don't know. Would you like to give a name? A Mark Langdale. He is okay. the, um, uh, the CEO of, of the foundation. Oh, thank you for that. Um, Alan Weinstein was the most recent archivist of the United States, but the advisory committee was established long before his tenure. Uh, how many meetings were held after Professor Weinstein began his tenure as archivist? Two. Two. Uh, do you know if Professor Weinstein supported and made use of the advisory committee? Well, at the, um, at the two meetings uh, held with um, Professor Weinstein, there was much discussion of um, marketing presidential libraries and funding for um, education programs and IT initiatives. Uh, there was concern expressed by the foundation members that um, the libraries didn't have uh, sort of the IT infrastructure that they needed to do um, far-reaching projects, digitization, et cetera. So there was that discussion. And then there was the discussion of uh, creating a marketing plan for presidential libraries, which my office later worked on and, and completed and, a marketing study. And do you think the next archivist of the United States should support and make use of the committee? I, I haven't talked to Mr. Ferrio, so I don't know. I would certainly recommend that he think about how best to use the committee for whatever, you know, however he is going to approach um, the issues in presidential libraries. I think there are ways that the committee can be helpful, or there are ways that, depending on what his goals are, that other types of committees could be helpful. How often do you think the committee should meet? I, I think um, once a year is a, is a practical matter, is useful. Should membership be open to individuals outside of the private library foundation? I think that's something for the archivist to consider. It's his committee. But I wouldn't object. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Flake, Flack, in your testimony, you said that the uh, FACA regulations state that in selecting members of, the, of a committee, the agency will consider a cross-section of those directly affected, interested, and qualified. Does the Advisory Committee on Presidential Libraries membership, limited only to those appointed by the private foundations, meet that criteria? For a committee like this one, and this is a discretionary committee, Mr. Chairman, it's up to the agency that is supporting this committee to make a decision on who should be on the committee. However, it would appear that this committee might be better served by broadening its membership. Thank you for that opinion. There, there, there are that, certainly complex relationships between this committee and the agency. And that, would, that could possibly require uh, some legislative direction for an agency. Uh, in if this if case. The, the agency could either make that decision on their own or they could be directed to do so, certainly. I see. Um, on, under FACA, should the members of the Advisory Committee on Presidential Library be classified as representatives or special government employees? The current membership who are representing the foundations should be classified as representatives, which they currently are. Okay. If there were additional members who are experts in uh, various fields, I would suggest those probably be classified as special government employees. And that was changed yesterday. Uh, excuse me, our, our uh, charter. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking him. Okay, all right. Um, if a member of the committee is classified as a representative, does FACA require a conflict of interest uh, check or any other kind of ethics related screening. Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, FACA is pretty silent with regard to ethics requirements. 
uh, but I know Office of Government Ethics would not require an ethics check on a representative member. Okay. Uh, Ms. Fawcett, for many years, members of the Presidential Libraries Committee were designated as SGEs. Uh, in 1999, they were all changed to representative, even though uh, NARA continued to report them as SGEs for almost 10 years. Uh, when these members were designated as special government employees, did they complete the proper requirements for reporting conflicts of interest? In 1999, our, our, our counsel, Chris Runkle, determined that after, I think it was an OGE audit, that these should be classified as represent, representatives, and it's mm -hmm. so reflected in our charter, the fact that our committee management staff failed to correctly note on the FACA database that they were representational, um, I think you know I think that's problematic for us. But the fact of the matter is, the charter itself declares that for the purposes of representation, they're representational members. It was a mistake in the FACA database. The charter is clear. The OGE audits are clear. The decisions have been clear since 1999. Prior to that, I couldn't tell you. Wow, that's 10 years. Between, well, you know, that's almost 10 years of, of a, an oversight, as you call it. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, no real explanation. I, I have for no that. explanation of why the committee management staff, which is not a part of my office, reported it this way. Okay, Mr. Flock, 11 of the 12 members of the Presidential Libraries Committee have no fixed terms of appointment, and five of the 12 have served for around 20 years. Is either common for federal advisory committees? Either in, of those in general, Mr. Chairman, no, that's not common behavior. Most advisory committees uh, rotate membership uh, terms of maybe two, three years. And for the most part, keep members no more than perhaps six. But there are exceptions, and this may be one of them. Okay. Um, for Dr. Greer or Mr. Flack, the president has recently encouraged agencies not to reappoint lobbyists to federal advisory committees, citing the need to introduce fresh points of view. Do you think that service on an advisory committee for 10 or 20 or more years should also be discouraged in order to add new perspectives? I think there's a couple of factors that go into advisory committee membership. One is continuity of uh, understanding of the issues. So sometimes it's good to have somebody who serves on the committee for a fair amount of time. But at the same time, it's good to give new opportunities to other people to participate and get a broader perspective on what the issues are. So I think there's, re there's room for both. I would second that. Hey, there, there is an issue of continuity, particularly in a multi-year project like the Electronic Records Archive, understanding some of the architectural decisions that were made early on and the intention there uh, is very helpful. So I, I would say uh, uh, a mix is appropriate. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Fawcett, as a uh, NARA claims in its official justification the advisory committee's assistance has been particularly useful in discussions of future financing of the libraries and the relationship between the libraries and their support organizations. If this is the case and these major events have occurred and continue to occur, uh, why have you not called a meeting of the committee in almost four years? It's not my responsibility to call a meeting of the committee. Okay, whose responsibility? It's is? the Archivist of the United States. Have you advised the Archivist to call a meeting, maybe? Um, we've discussed having a meeting and he chose not to have one. Okay, he chose not to have one. Okay, uh, and Anna, oh. And in the last four years, have you tried to schedule a meeting or recommended that the committee meet? In the last four years, have we tried to schedule a meeting? Uh, no, we have not scheduled a meeting in the last four years. As I said in my statement or in answer to an earlier question, I think Archivist Weinstein was more comfortable meeting one-on-one -on -one 
with the foundations, and he chose that uh, path and uh, met regularly across the nation with individual presidential foundations to discuss issues, budget, um, governance issues, et cetera. Has uh, any member of the committee requested that you call a meeting within the last four years? Not that I recall. Uh, in your testimony, you said that uh, members of the advisory committee communicate with and make recommendations to NARA uh, without formally meeting. You also say that these members or other representatives of the Library Foundation have begun to meet and to invite NARA officials to participate in at least a part of those meetings. Uh, do you have any concerns that this seems to indicate that the representatives of the private foundations are operating outside of the reporting and transparency requirements of FACA? Uh, since since our only role at that meeting was to deliver a fairly perfunctory report on our activities, um, I think that the foundations have every, um, every right to meet among themselves to discuss issues of concern to them. Mm -hmm. There were, I think, 32 or 33 members who came to that meeting of which, and I had an attendance list so I know who came, there were five or maybe six who had ever been to an advisory committee meeting. So most of the people who attended that meeting were not advisory committee members. Okay, but I mean, look, look at the process here. They well, are we calling, didn't govern the process, yeah, they are Mr. Calling, Chairman. <laughs> they are calling the meetings and then NARA is participating. NARA, uh, could NARA's be, participation was very, very brief. Okay, it's, it's really blurring, and we didn't it's participate in any here. discussions. We okay. participated in okay. no discussions. We are blurring the lines here of what is proper and transparent. I think, and uh, it, it it really calls into question uh, what we are trying to achieve here. Well, we didn't intend to blur any lines of transparency. Well, I'm telling you what it's starting to look like. Uh, late yesterday, we received a letter from NARA explaining errors and discrepancies in the reporting of information about your committee. How did that series of errors over the course of several years occur, and how were they identified? In preparation for this hearing, I actually became aware that there was this FACA database um, over the years, my staff would be asked um, periodically, specifically the uh, designated federal official on my staff, who was not me, uh, would be asked to supply certain information and he would be asked specific questions and we, so we supplied that information. But it turned out that we weren't asked all the information that is in the FACA database, so therefore certain errors occurred. We had not reviewed the database until recently, and uh, mea culpa for not knowing of its existence and reviewing it on a regular basis to make sure the information was correct. But we will take corrective action and ensure that in the future that all the designations are appropriate and correct and Thank timely. You. Thank you for that response. Uh, Mr. Flock, there seem to be many areas where NARA's reporting is either incomplete or incorrect. Uh, in the FACA database. Is the agency responsible for providing accurate, up-to-date information for the public? Yes, it is, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Flock, why should we be concerned about compliance with the information reporting requirements of FACA? Well, when inaccurate information is reported, it's reviewed by many outside sources. It's the source of newspaper articles. It's the source of misinformation. Uh, it uh, results in hearings like this one. Thank you for that response. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's me, but I, I just think, you know, this uh, system of, of presidential libraries uh, is very troubling uh, and, and it's not uh, well-connected and transparent. And, and I think that NARA 
uh, needs to do a better job of of um, being open and 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 having a process that's open uh, and 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 that's more public oriented and more open to the public and and it's just uh, um, I'm 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 very uneasy about. Uh, what we have discovered over the last couple of months of, of, in, of inquiry, uh, and, 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 and Ms. Fawcett, I look forward uh, to the new archivists coming in and explaining uh, to us uh, just how we will proceed uh, as a government and, and with our relationship with presidential libraries. Uh, it, it's kind of willy-nilly now this whole process and it's not clear uh, and and we ought to be able to to clearly clearly define it uh, in this new era of open government uh, and transparency and, and 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 I would like to see more openness from NARA uh, on how we administer presidential libraries or the relationship with those committees and the libraries we made uh, numerous suggestions in the alternative model report on how to um, how to have um, a better governance relationship with the presidential foundations, and I I'd be happy to refer you to that report. I'll leave you with a copy of it, uh, especially um, sure. you know, we we identified five particular models uh, for the future for presidential libraries that would cost less. Or, and not all of them cost less, as it turned out, but Model 1, which was some variation of the present system, suggested that, uh, that the, the presidential libraries scattered across the country bring value to the country. The presidency is the one office elected by everyone, and to have libraries established across the country where citizens have access to them brings the presidency to these communities where many citizens, students benefit. But the libraries, as I said, the relationship between library foundations and NARA is complex, and it could be more open, and it could be better, and it could be better established through a governance relationship that's stipulated either through NARA regulations or in statute. And I, I agree completely with you that there are more things we can do. We've worked hard to be as open and transparent as we can. We meet regularly with people. We have not... Um, attempted to foster any secret meetings. Uh, the, uh, the, the, we do meet individually with foundations. I, I travel to the libraries and visit, um, visit the libraries, and while I'm there, visit the presidential foundations, encourage them to work with the library directors on programs and exhibits, and to gain an historic, you know, to have a more appropriate and more um, nuanced historical perspective in the exhibits and you know I'm, I'm really pleased to say that uh, we are seeing that happen as new exhibits are being planned and you know I appreciate the chairman's uh, concern and I know I will take that concern to the archivist as we discuss the future of presidential libraries so thank uh, you for your concern. Thank you for the response Ms. Foster and you know um, Public presidential libraries do bring uh, a value to the public. Uh, uh, personally, I've, I've visited several. I'm glad uh, to hear that. My children enjoy uh, every one that they visit. Um, and we house one in Missouri, mm -hmm. the uh, Truman Library in Independence. Uh, and, and, and I think all of them bring value uh, to the public. Uh, it, it just it, it this hearing has indicated to me that uh, we need to have some clearly defined rules and statutes that of, of for, for which these libraries ought to operate under uh, and and the sooner the better right and I, I refer you to the paper we wrote on alternative models that has several suggestions just in please that. share that with committee staff and, I think the uh, committee staff may have a copy but I'm happy to leave another okay. one with them all right that'll be fine and uh, uh, that will conclude this hearing I want to thank all of you uh, for your participation in this today uh, and thank you and God bless you hearing thank you, Mr. Chairman.
So what do you have? Uh, we got this. Oh, cool. Nice. 